Hello and welcome to True Footy Podcast 39, starring JT and the Bushman once again for our yeah. post-grand final podcast today, Bush. How are you feeling after a particularly big weekend? Uh, um, I pulled up surprisingly well, really, considering how big of a weekend I had. I'm yeah. quite relieved. Grand, grand final day is a notorious um, sort of day for people to get mashed up, yeah. um, so to speak. Uh, especially this one, I think... People were partially doing it to forget that utterly disgraceful grand final that we were subjected to. We were drinking as a distraction from watching the game yeah. at one point. There, we were just... Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, uh, sorry, Mortz and I were doing a live stream on the channel. Uh, in t- we had a really successful live stream, actually nearly 20,000 views on it, um, despite well, yeah, it being, very like, nice. being like three days ago. 150 people jumped on at the same time, um, or at one time, which was awesome. Um, but I have to say, it was really funny how many people jumped onto the stream and were like, where the fuck's the game? Isn't this a stream? Who are these gay lords? <laughs> I guess that, that probably would be a factor because a lot of international people were trying to find a way to watch the game. Mm. Even we were trying to set it up on a second screen in the house I was watching the game at out the back. Oh, okay. But we couldn't, like, we KO couldn't do it. Yeah, right. Seven thought- Live, Seven doesn't have live tally through their... F- well, if not for the Grandy, they wouldn't let you watch it live through their internet right. app. Oh, okay, that's yeah. nice, yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah, no, thank you to those who joined in who couldn't watch the game or who could watch the game and decided to watch it along with us. Um, I found it a bit more fun. I'm quite glad I did a live stream in hindsight. Um, took the, you know, the, it, it took away from the fact that the game wasn't particularly interesting. But uh, just to round off with the predictions, those who did best included Callum, who was um, the guy who guest starred on the live stream. His he uh, tipped Richmond by 35 and Jeremy Cameron first goal. So he got that right. Uh, but the closest margin was uh, young King Cookson, who sent his predictions in, um, and he tipped 60 points, which was a pretty good tip in hindsight. It ended up being yeah. 89. Nobody had Dusty as Norm Smith medalist. Yeah, that's what killed my betting, really, because I, I jumped on Prestier as like my favourite sort of Norm Smith type of bet. Mm. That was uh, I bet on Prestier and Hawley. Because they were both yeah. juicier odds. I think I just skipped Dusty because it was a bit obvious. Yeah, I skipped him as yeah, well. The odds, similar uh, logic. Odds weren't that generous, but he he did have actually a really really good grand mm. final. Way a way better grand final performance than his last one. He had four goals and twenty possessions, which is like it was more deserving of this one than the last one. Probably. Yeah, but again, it was one of those games where Richmond just dominated. Everyone got a piece of the pie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they were all just hammering it home. Marley and Pickett. Had uh, you know twenty two and a goal or whatever yeah, it was. He had a day out, and some of his, he was just waltzing it out of the center. Like that there was spin. no pressure. Well, bit, bit of spin. Ooh, I, don't, I don't know. I thought that was a bit of a pointless spin. There was no pressure on him. Yeah. But anyway, I personally this Marlin Pickett thing does my head in. I don't. I yeah. Don't, like, half the questions I were asking the Norm Smith medalist Dusty after the game were about Marlin Pickett. Yeah. Seriously. It's like the West Australian when Fife won the bloody Brownlow. I reckon like yeah, that's true. That was funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bush is referring to how in WA when uh, Fife on the brown low, um, 60% of the, the front page the next day was Willy Rioli's, like, it was like a... A, a, fan, a poll of Western Australians, two-thirds of people thinking he should get off. <laughs> and Fife was just a little thumbnail in the corner. Yeah, after he'd won the brown low. <laughs> yeah, the West Australian is a little bit biased, but, um, yeah. well, yeah, but we were just talking about Marley Pickett, man, like... Half of Richmond's fans probably didn't know his name two weeks ago. Yeah, they prob- a lot of them probably didn't even know he was their VFL best and fairest until his name for the Grandy. Yeah, it's just the media sort of like getting a, getting around a narrative that's a it, darling. It's juicy, but you know, a media darling. Yeah, yeah. So other than that annoying par- um, picket narrative, Richmond were just utterly dominant. And do you think at the moment they are the best team in the game? Definitely, especially considering last year they were one shit game away from another Grandy that they could have won. Mm, Would have true. been a tougher game probably than this one turned out for sure. Oh, but 100%. <laughs> they were very, they'd be a very good chance for a free paid if they'd gotten past Collingwood last year. Yeah, that's true. I would have still tipped West Coast, but yeah. I'm an Eagles fan. Um, anyway, but we'll just have a look at the Richmond season because it is quite astounding the way it's gone. They they were 7-6 se- and six at the bye. They were famously uh, injury slammed. You know, they yeah. lost Rants in round one against Carlton. Rewalt um, was out early for a patch. Exactly right. Rewalt was out for a lot. There was, a, there was a smattering of other injuries. It wasn't just those guys. I can't remember off the top of my head. Clutching for a few. Yeah, Clutching yeah. did miss um, a few games like here and there, definitely. Uh, but because uh, I criticised them for, in previous years, maybe, well, not criticised them, but I had the sort of caveat, like, these guys have had dream injury runs yeah. and dream fixtures. Of course, they're going to win the flag or go, you know, minor premiership. 
This year they had that adversity and they turned it around and were really good. So they were seven and six, and I think your percentage was around about a hundred mid year. Mm. And uh, I've said it in a previous podcast, but they got smashed by North Geelong and Adelaide in consecutive weeks, and they didn't lose a game after that. Did you see the statistic, though, comparing their 2017 premiership to their 2019? Their points for and against were virtually identical. Their points yeah. for were, in fact, identical, I think, and then the points against was 10 difference, 10 points off. Yeah. Other yeah. than that, their seasons were virtually identical, same wins and losses. Mm. Yeah, it is interesting because uh, the, the, I remember in 2017 they did have, I think they lost four in a row at one point in, in the start of that year. Yeah. And nobody was considering them a realistic final chance. Uh, sorry, flag chance. At, and even uh, I remember going into the finals, they were they finished third, and I think Geelong and Adelaide were the two teams. Although this year, even from third, I think everyone yeah, kind of everyone felt like was on Richmond. This it was year Richmond's sure. flag to lose, and I thought that Collingwood were the best contender against them, which is why it's really frustrating that Collingwood bottled that prelim final. But um, if if you weren't to say Richmond were the best team this year, who would be the next best contender? I'd probably be inclined to say Geelong for this year. In this hindsight, year, just looking okay. at this year. Because if, if you think yeah, about it, West Coast and Collingwood kind of bottled it and weren't consistent enough throughout the year. And Geelong... Geelong like, set themselves up for it and just had one bad game, really. They Well, yeah. So they lost two finals, but they yeah. were both against MCG teams. In, yeah. Uh, yeah, and like they would have hosted one of them. Mm. Um, and they finished minor premiers. So they're probably the next best team. And we kind of got the... The prelim probably was the grand final we... We're looking for the Richmond, Richmond G Long. yeah, yeah, Richmond G Long. Did I say G Long? Good G Long. Um, but anyway, interesting side note every year since 2013, a flag has been won by either Clarkson or a Clarkson assistant coach. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and of course, the runner up was another uh Clarkson assistant coach in Leon Cameron this year. So those coaches were Beveridge, Simpson, Hardwick, and uh, yeah, Cameron and Clarkson himself. So that's ridiculous, but yeah, just staying on the Richmond line for just a little longer. What is their outlook for next season? And do you think they have potential for a, sinis- a serious dynasty going forward? The way they've set up, that you can't really see them slowing down too much next year. Mm. Maybe it's one of those ones you can't really see it going for too long into the future, but they've probably got another year or two at the very least in their top peak power sort of run. I think they are set up for another three or four, personally. I think huh? this could be another Hawthorne light run. Not necessarily winning a three-peat from here, but... The, their list profile is really good. They, their players aren't that old. You know what I mean? Their best players. Like yeah. Dusty would be 28. I yeah, think. as you say, he's closer to 30. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I guess those players aren't slowing down. You know, Dusty's playing yeah. really good football. Rewalt's probably the one closest to retirement. I think he's the Rance oldest. is pretty old as well. Rance is either the same age or a year younger. But, again, Hodgson's another... pretty old. Yeah, again, I don't think these players are near the end. Mm. Whereas I'd contrast that with some of Geelong's players. Unlike, Geelong's better. definitely closer to the end compared to Richmond, mm. but yeah. But then, uh, but the other point to that is Richmond have also filled in a lot of this the new talent. Uh, yeah. Pickett's one who's twenty seven. I'll say so. Pickett's old, so don't use him as an well, example. Well, he's still got no, he's still got a few years left, mind you. Mm. Like we don't actually know he's good at AFL level yet. Mm. He's played one game, but like guys like Shy Bolton, Sydney Stack, all these guys, it's really a testament to Richmond. Well, I say testament, but maybe not so much, but. They've really been rewarded for t- picking two West Australian guys that everyone else didn't touch that yeah. were clearly good enough for AFL level and they've taken the risk and it's probably paid off with Sydney Stack and Marlene Pickett. But then again, as I say that, as a big club like Richmond, you probably there's probably less pressure to take those picks. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You even saw that a few years ago when Hawthorne took the chance on Dale Garlett. Exactly right. Yeah, whereas, you know, if you're... A, when they were at the peak of their powers. If you're a middling club with maybe less established culture, maybe then you don't... And it, Take the risk. thing is with these clubs that are performing well, like Richmond and Hawthorne at these times and they're taking these sort of players, they don't have the luxury of high draft picks. They have to be more creative in finding talent so they Good point. take these sort of opportunities. Good point. More. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Um, so, yeah, I guess with Richmond, I think we both agree. Probably in the frame for 21 again yeah, next year. Definitely. That'd be the favourite for next year, early yeah, days. Probably. But yeah. 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 Who knows? Um, GWS, Subject to trade period of free agency and all that, obviously. Yeah, I can't imagine too many different moves he, happening. Um, Tim Kelly's probably the biggest name to change clubs this year to West Coast, but I don't know if that would shift things too much in terms of premiership uh, favoritism. But anyway, GWS is the other club that played the grand final. Uh, I can understand why people would forget they played in the grand final because we didn't see them after quarter time. Uh, but we'll have a look at their year generally. They started the year very strongly. They smashed Richmond in round three, albeit while they were injury-plagued. 
Then they beat the Cats at GMHBA, which I've talked about on this podcast, but they were the only team to do it. And I think from there, they kind of announced themselves as a genuine like quality team that could push all the way. But then the following week, I think the Dockers beat them. Yeah, I was going to say that's around the time we pipped them in Canberra. Yeah. Um, I think it was Canberra. The Dockers beat some good teams this year, to be fair. Uh, yes, it was yeah. Canberra, you're right. Um, but anyway, so GWS had all this potential, and I thought their end of the season was really unconvincing. We saw well, They lost at home to Brisbane. Uh, they got smashed by Hawthorne and the Bulldogs, which was pretty pathetic. Um, but then finals came, and they took their opportunity and made a grand final from sixth, which is um, pretty rare. I don't know how many okay. times that's actually happened. I know the Bulldogs made it from seventh and one. Adelaide had a fifth, I think. They did. Stage. They won the flag from fifth, although technically in a different finals eight system. Yeah. It was like first versus eighth back then. Okay. Uh, so it is different. But yeah, no, either way, it's, it's a, it was a really good achievement considering how many consecutive away games they played. So they played, oh, they, they played two away finals in a row, GWS, and then obviously the third was the grand final. In hindsight, was it a waste of a grand final spot? Pro- well, obviously Collingwood probably would have pushed them a bit further, really. Mm. with the experience and redemption narrative and all that. Once they're there, 100,000, the crowd would have been more evenly distributed. Yeah, very true. The crowd would have been a factor. I said at the yeah. start, um, GWS needed to limit how many early goals Richmond got because of that roar of that crowd was always going to be a huge yeah, factor. That Rioli goal right on that end of the first yeah. quarter, that could have been a... that. In terms of that, would have been a killer. The crowd was going off. The bloody everyone was going off. I totally agree with you. I, said this, I think I said the same thing on the live stream that... that right at the end of the quarter yeah. would have been a huge boost for Richmond. Um, other than that, GWS did a pretty good job of staunching the, the sort of the bleeding early. Yeah. Like Richmond didn't really get off the hook until the second quarter. But um, yeah, I just, I'm really, I thought it was a really lame effort from GWS. I think I always get angry at G- grand final teams when they don't show up because I'm like, come on, man, you, yeah. <laughs> you owed us a good grand final, which get is up. obviously a bit silly, but um also, they did. They, they not only did they play shit, but they did it in their shitty white jumper, <laughs> which I'm not letting go of. I can't believe someone made a decision to make GWS wear white, right. whether it be themselves or someone at the AFL who forced them to wear that monstrosity of a jumper. Maybe the AFL forced them to wear it so it's symbolic of the AFL making them surrender to the Victorian well, conspiracy. That's exactly what happened in the end. Um, they sucked. But anyway, I went a bit overboard. I was going to make a surrender joke and went a bit elaborate, really. <laughs> Oh, Never Surrender because of their song? Is that in there? <laughs> yes. I've heard all the jokes. Of it. I've heard the song, but like Never I haven't heard that specific surrender. lyric. Yeah, yeah. No, it's actually a lyric. But anyway. I've just heard the giant land sort of stuff. Giant land? Is that another word? Isn't it? Giant, well, fuck. I don't know. I just yeah. remember the tune. Yeah, more of them, yeah. <laughs> Those memes were quality. Yeah. Anyway, it was all for nothing in the end. But a great marketing ploy for, oh, a marketing sort of effect for um, GWS, no doubt. Now everyone yeah. knows their team song. Um, but what's the outlook for the Giants going forward after this? Um, pretty positive, really. Bad. Like They can look back at this and go, we made the most of a sixth finish year. Mm-hmm. If we put in a bit better in the main season, we can get a top four finish, have a double chance, get a real good chance to assault the finals properly. Yeah. We've still got a shitload of talent. I agree. Yep. They're fine. I think they'll reflect on this season once the heartache subsides that it was a really successful season. I think this was the first of a few years where GWS have to take the next step. And I said, uh, I've said it before, but like pre-finals, I thought they've blown it to improve. But that was before the finals because I didn't think they were a realistic shot of going all the way. Um, But what they've done now is got themselves some grand final experience, proven they can win away finals at the MCG. Um, they can also lose them by 89, but they can also win them against yeah. Collingwood. So, I, and I, you know, we talk about that some of their best players like Cameron, uh, Green, Cornelio, Whitfield. These guys are all my age or younger. Yeah. So I'm 26, nearly 26. Yeah, that's what I mean. They're set still. They're like, yeah. They're still going to see improvement from guys like Hopper, Taranto. Yeah, 100%. So, it, like, some people have been talking about, you know, this GWS premiership window closing a few weeks ago. Like, I criticise them, but I, I think to suggest that their window is closing was ridiculous considering how young a lot of their best players are. Like, they're just in their prime now. So, I'm starting to think this could be the first of something big for GWS. However, however, there's a really interesting stat about teams that get belted in grand finals. Uh, I think... Over the last, I don't know how many, it was several decades, but if you get, if you lose a grand final by 40 plus, you don't win a final the next year. 
it's happened over the last Oof. couple of decades. So if that stat follows and maybe painful season ahead yeah. for GWS, but on paper, and if we're just talking logically, I think you and I agree probably. I think they have the potential to finish top two. They probably have the most talented list top mm. to bottom, really. Yeah. They don't have like the proven system like a Richmond or West Coast, but the talent yeah. on paper does stack up really, exactly. really well. Exactly. They just need yeah. to. Yeah. If they can't figure it out, Leon Cameron's probably going to start getting a bit of attention if they can't really click in the next couple of years, I think, yeah. at that point, because they do have the talent. It does seem really harsh, but I understand where you're coming from. And that. when you see teams like Richmond and West Coast system teams mm. where their talent's still very good, don't get me wrong, but yeah. not. But they can just rotate yeah. a player yeah. in and then exactly. they can play in the system. Yeah, yeah. That's very true. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I forgot to write this in my notes, but I realized we haven't actually discussed the Brown Low at all because that happened after we recorded yeah. the last potty. So it happened a week ago, but we haven't touched it. So Nat Fife winning his yeah. second Brown Low medal convincingly. I can't believe how well, how dominant he was actually. In, in losing of efforts in particular. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like I did, I did have him pegging a few three vote games in losing efforts, but I think it was like three yeah. or four, which is ridiculous. I think he started better He'd than I had. He got nearly more votes in losing games than winning games. It was 16 in yeah. losing games to 17 in winning, I believe. Yeah, he's, he's a ridiculous magnet for Brownlow votes. The other one who really surprised me was Paddy Cripps with... The early start. 13 like, out of yeah. 15, and it's never happened before. So he got 13 yeah. votes out of a uh, possible 15 in the first, in the five, first rounds. five rounds, and they lost four out of those five games, yeah. which is insane. Um, we've said it before, but if Carlton start winning games, then surely he's going to... Perennial. Yeah, he's going to be up there for Brownlow votes every year. I didn't even think his year was that consistent. I, I, maybe, I'm obviously, right. maybe I'm wrong, but like through the middle of the year, I remember he, he had a bit of a lean trot. I guess all players did yeah. at some point. But Yeah, I remember once Carlton started firing, it was because of other guys, not so much him being very spectacular. True. Very true, because he's consistently spectacular. Yeah. So, yeah, that's very true. Um, but alas, um, oh, actually, well, I will ask you because we, I've talked about this a little bit on the channel, but I'll ask your opinion. Who is the best player in the game right now? It's hard to go past Fife, probably. Like, mm. he hasn't even really had much of a chance to show his aerial abilities the past few years. He still occasionally takes a big mark, but mm. he still really can take that to an, show that level of his game again. But he's been more of a clearance base work and he's more midfield game, yeah bit of time in the forward line when we need him but yeah that's true more of a bull really these days five mm, yep fair enough he's going to need some more assistance next year with Definitely. Brad Hill uh appears on his way to the Saints and that's yeah. a fairly good se segue because obviously the season's over but now the yeah. draft period starting um AFL Trade Radio I think started up again today yeah. uh which is always good fun for getting you through those days um especially at work we have a public holiday here yeah. today but other than that um, it's good to have that back, but um, I, maybe we can start off with the Gold Coast Suns Bush yeah. because they um, today's they, news they did have a big announcement today. They were and it was announced that they are, like everyone's been speculating yeah. are they going to get picks one and two as a priority pick? They ended up getting that and a whole lot more, which is yeah. really interesting. They hit the bloody jackpot there. Yes, yeah, so um, they're going to be given pick one this year. So they already yeah. have pick one. They're going to get pick at the start of the draft. So they're going to have one and two effectively. Yeah. In addition to that, they're also be giving a start of second rounder, which is pick 20 currently. And if that's not enough, they've been given pick 11 next year, yeah. uh, which is a mid-first mid, dra mid -first round dra draft pick. So, um, And then pick 19 the following year after that. Yeah. So they're giving four first rounders, the, one of which is pick yeah. one. <laughs> and the other one I feel that's probably very big in all this is the fact that I don't have to bid for their academy players. Yes, well, That's huge, that especially with their expanded territory range. I don't know if I like it. It's a little bit... Yeah. I don't know how much of an advantage it's actually that, for them, but that yeah. might be the way they all go now, Yeah, all academies. But then again... If I they do that for everyone, I don't mind it, but if it's just Gold Coast mm. would do that and then... But how would you feel if Sydney was just starting giving all their academy players without bidding? That sort of changes it a little mm. bit, doesn't it? You know, if they were just given a um, Blakey. Yeah, it's still... That, he was father's son, wasn't he, Blakey? Uh, maybe you're right. No, was he? No, no, he was a North father son and a Sydney Academy player. And he chose but his old boys at Sydney or something. Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he was he was technically Sydney Academy. Yeah. Um, or like a Heaney, just given, you know, just for nothing. Uh, so I, I think that's problematic long term. But for now, because Gold Coast suck, it's not mm. a big deal. I think the big thing with all these Gold Coast moves that the AFL has done is that I think they're effectively trying to give them a re 
Boat a fresh chance mm. Mm. at really building themselves as a club. Yeah. So well, I've actually, I was actually reading some interesting stuff. It was on Reddit. It was, it was people's comments. So I don't know like how true it is, but there seemed to be a consistent narrative of how Gold Coast infrastructure has improved exponentially the past couple of years, their management and everything. Apparently, for the first five years of their existence, they were playing out of demountables. Yeah, right. Their headquarters was like a bunch of demountables out the back of somewhere. In, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Like it was an absolute shit pool of a yeah. shit show by <laughs> shit the sounds. <laughs> absolute shit show by the sounds. That but they've started to turn it around. They've given them the proper resources. Have they had an now, upgrading facilities? I saw someone say yeah, something that's, like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, that's yeah. part of it. They've got new facilities. They seem to have better management and mm. people up there making sure, what's, making sure it's better run. So, yeah. So now this they're is giving them this is their second chance basically. So they've given them these concessions to mm. give them every chance to actually prop the club up and succeed. See, this is why I've never really liked the Gold Coast to Tassie argument because it's not the fact that they're in Queensland why Gold Coast are so bad, in my mm. opinion. Well, um, it softened me on after reading this stuff. It softened my thoughts on it a bit. Yeah, but, but we're seeing across the league like all these players leaving. Partly it would have been because Gold Coast. As you say, mm. as you just described, must be a bit of a shithole. But uh, all rebuilding sides start to lose players after a certain amount of time. Yeah. And if Gold Coast are perpetually rebuilding, that's why players are going mm. home. Look, I bet Brisbane now has much better retention now yeah. that they're a good club. Even these people that were Queenslanders, they were pretty much saying, yeah, look at Brisbane. They, One of them was even saying pretty much any sport in Queensland, they bandwagon. Mm. So like, mm. as soon as the team gets any good, they'll start showing up. Well, Brisbane's it's, taken a few Gold Coast players. Yeah, well, the qu- one of the quotes I loved actually was this guy who's like, he was basically saying, if Queensland are doing any good and being the rest of Australia, there'll be someone wearing maroon shorts, drinking 4X, screaming for Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. They get a bit rowdy up that way. Yeah, fair enough. Um, the other thing that has been added to the Suns in terms of benefits from the AFL, there's two things. The uh, 10 rookies. The 10 rookie list, which I think is going to be good for them in the sense that it'll probably promote a bit more recruiting of mature ages. So maybe yeah. they take the pun on Nathan Freeman, for instance, or, or in hindsight, yeah. but like the next Nathan Freeman. Someone they're not too sure about having on the list because it clogs the list, but if they've got 10 extra rookie spots, or yeah. six extra rookie spots to four. Even Nathan depth. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So that, that does help a little bit. Um, and the other one was expanded their academy zone to Darwin. Yeah. So not all the Northern Territory, I presume. I think it's just Darwin. Yeah. But um, that helps a little bit. Yeah. If it was all of Northern Territory, it'd be huge. Oh, man. Imagine that. They'd have some good players potentially in their list. Um, The Riolis. Yeah. Yeah, And uh, who else? There was one other player I was thinking of. Uh, Parfit is another. He's a decent player to have on the list. But anyway. um, So with Gold Coast picks, what do you think should be their strategy now, well, first of all, actually, I th- I just want to comment and say, I think it's a little bit too much, these these concessions. Probably a bit overboard, really. The point you make is interesting about them giving them a reboot because they probably need it. But nonetheless, I think it's a little bit too much of a a middle finger to every other club. Yeah, it is a bit of a... <laughs> you know, I would have been fine with picks one and two. Even that was a stretch. I would have said yeah. end of first round. Yeah. Uh, picks one and two I would have lived with. Um, but the interesting point for them now is they've got potentially going to hold on to Raul and Anderson, who, for those who don't follow the draft, are considered the clear top two players in the draft. So Very for, close. They're good friends. Yeah. Play Vic Country. Yeah. Is it those so, two? So it could be another country. Barry or McCluggage situation, where Barry and McCluggage situation, where yeah. Brisbane targeted recruiting them because they were mates and they were going to try and build the culture and also um, reduce the risk of going home factor. Yeah. Um, so you could get that with Gold Coast, but the other interesting thing for me now is They that both could be stars as well. You could true. be getting two absolute stars for the, true. the backbone of your club for the next decade. But let's say Brad Crouch agrees to come to the Suns on a million a year, Yeah. Okay, which I think would be a good deal for them because they're not mm. spending that money anywhere else and they need a big marquee talent. And Brad Crouch is a good player. I know he has his disposal issues, but... He'd yeah. still be just about their best midfielder. I'd say probably best yeah. midfielder. He would be their best midfielder. Best probably midfielder their second sure. best player up there with Wits. I don't know. He's probably better than Wits actually. Yeah. Wits is a very good ruckman. Wit- he's their best player. Yeah, but anyway, so yeah, Brad Crouch agrees to come yeah. to Adla- uh, from Adelaide. He's contracted, so you have to do yeah. a deal with Adelaide. Yeah. Adelaide is asking for pick one. What do you do as your goal? I'd probably roll on Roland, Rowland Anderson. I 
you take one and two instead. I reckon in this not generally, but in this particular instance with Raul and Anderson's connection, yeah, the fact they're clearly head and shoulders the two names in the draft. From what I've heard about the draft, it's yeah. them two and everyone else. That's true. Um, they've both been said described as Sam Walsh, if not better, type of players. Mm. Yep. Well, I'd take two of them over Brad Crouch. It is a risk, but you are, you are getting two. Well, no, I'm not saying often pick one and two. I'm saying like... Well, yeah, but one. I'm saying the package of the two young guys, because if you only take one of them, that might be slightly more of a flight risk. Yep. That sort of thing, but the package of them... Mm. It does help that the Gold Coast now have picks 11 and 20 as well. Yeah. So, or, or no, so it's 11 next year and 20. Yeah. They've got 15 or something this year though as well. So yeah, good. they do. Yeah. Yeah. So they do have a bit to bargain with there. But if you're Adelaide and you have got a contracted Brad Crouch, they're probably going to ask for pick one or two. Yeah. In my, I'd imagine, I can't mm. imagine them getting yeah. that. Uh, that'd be stupid not to ask. Or Lakotius and Rankin. Now that is an interesting yeah, prospect. That does make that, yeah. I'd, I'd be prepared, more prepared to trade them for Brad Crouch from picks one and two, I reckon. Really? So you're saying Raul and Anderson over Lukosius and Rankin? Yeah, especially because the fact those Lukosius and Rankin are South Australian as well. Mm -hmm. You could probably almost go the two of them for Crouch and maybe something from Adelaide, something small. Yeah, see, the issue I have with the, trading out these young guns is they're just, just starting a new merry-go-round of talent. Mm. They just trade out the players that have been there for a couple of years. Ben King, who has just won the grand final sprint, um, looks like an absolute gun yeah. for the Suns. How how realistic is it they're going to keep on to him as well, considering he's got Max at St Kilda and St Kilda are going to come hard? Mm. Not this year. I um, think it's year. easier if they don't if they're not trying to give him and Lukosius mm. opportunities. If it was hundred percent, we'll give you every opportunity because Lukosius was sent for Brad Crouch mm. in this hypothetical. Yeah. I think you'd be more likely to keep him if you could really give him that spot and attention. Yeah. That'd help. Fair enough. I, I'm i more inclined to trade pick two. I don't, I'd try and offer pick two for Crouch. Take mm -hmm. Raul and try and keep Lukosius in ranking. I personally, I really, really like Lukosius as well as a mm -hmm. talent. But I think a lot of it comes down to you need to have a... You need to be able to gauge what these young players are thinking. Because if Lukosius and ranking want to leave after four years... Lukosius hasn't signed an extension yet, but that doesn't oh, okay. necessarily mean True. too much. But doesn't help. Yeah, <laughs> the manager only has a year to go. Basically. That is actually interesting. Yeah. So that does change it because if you can kind of gauge that this player is going to leave anyway, yeah, then maybe you do get rid of him and keep Net Row and Anderson. But yeah, yeah, interesting. So maybe if we have a look at the Adelaide side of things as well, um, how much of a, how much of a loss would Brad Crouch be? Let's say they were given pick one or two for him, so Raul or Anderson. I feel like at that point they almost should just go full ka full kablam and mm. commit with their blow up, flip lead for picks. If it's been one that's rumored. I don't know if I'd go with lead, but if they're already losing Crouch, losing lead would be too much of a disaster. Mm. Considering they also just lost Cal uh, Ellis Yeoman. Yeah. I don't know what they'll get in terms of because it's a free agency, but I don't know what they'll. He get. was in and out of their twenty two though. He wouldn't be a first rounder, I'd imagine. Mm. I don't know. It yeah. depends on the contract, but four year deal is pretty lengthy actually. Yeah. But um, he's got upside. Yeah, bets to Carlton, not a huge loss. Yeah, not a good thing to happen in my opinion. They should have kept him. Um, but nonetheless, he's like old yeah. anyway. They're gonna have it to replace like him. Seems like they're blowing it up. Jacobs to GWS probably. Mm. Greenwood might be on the way to Gold Coast. Brad Crouch um, and Alex Keith has requested a trade to the Bulldogs. So there's a lot of players going out of Adelaide yeah. at the moment. I wonder how much of a destabilizing effect losing Crouch would have. Um. And, you know, does that mean it's harder to keep Matt if Brad Crouch It definitely leaves? makes it harder to keep Matt. You'd go, if you were Gold Coast and you signed Brad, you'd go hard at Matt Crouch the next couple yeah. of years. I, I would anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know that, I understand that Brad Crouch is probably not worth pick one to any other side. I've got a, a more expanded hypothetical here. Crouch brothers for Rankin, Lukosius, and something else. Yeah. 15 and 20. Ranking the coaches 15 and 20. For the Crouch Brothers. It's hard to get my head around it. Yeah. It's hard to get the talent. Yeah, so oh, I guess for Gold Coast. That would work for both teams, I think, because Adelaide, if they're blowing it up anyway, you're getting a yeah. good foundation with Lukosius and Rankin. Yeah. 
Interesting. That's an interesting. We'll put it to the viewers. What do we think about that one? Yeah. Lukosius. Off the top of my Lank- head. Lukosius and Lankin um, <laughs> for the Crouch Brothers. Now, I know there's the, the Crouch Brothers don't have their... Like, they have their detractors, mm. especially in the Discord, um, which is fair enough. They don't use the ball that well. But I think if it was any other club than Gold Coast, I think Gold Coast need these prime age players to come in and improve the side now because they're going to have draft picks like for years. Yeah. You know what I mean? That draft access to talent... It's not going to be a problem for them. What is the problem is retaining these prime age players who can improve the side now on and off the field. They need a boost. So, you know, if they push finals in a couple of years on the back of Crouch and maybe a few other players like Greenwood, Billy Stretch, yeah. I think it's been linked to them. Brandon Ellis, where we haven't even mentioned Yeah, Brandon yet. Ellis is big, will be a good player for him, I think. Yeah, through free agency, just the best 22 player. Yeah. I think they probably need to sacrifice the future just for a little bit of a boost now. Because, like I said, their talent, they're always going to have access to the draft. Mm. Now, I, yeah, like I said, I don't want to necessarily give up the whole farm, like Lukosius yeah. Rankin I'd rather keep. But, um, yeah, maybe right. maybe short-term gain for long-term like loss is probably where I'd go with that. But um, to, to round off on a few other trade rumors... Um, the Bulldogs, I did mention Keith is going to the, uh, has requested a trade to the Bulldogs and Josh Bruce from St. Kilda, um, which I think is probably only going to be about a future second. Yeah, so it should be deal. a massive deal, that one. That is a great trade for the Dogs. I think they, um, oh, Keith as well, because I think the mm. Dogs really need to bolster their back line. They, they lost Roughhead, who became a really good calling. Mate, uh, Keith's the only fullback to get two best on grounds in the Brownlow, I think, mate. Oh, is that right? Yeah, or something like that. Interesting. Because he had a few free voters. Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, Keith into the back line and then Bruce up forward to sort of support Norton as he's developing. They've already got good talent across the rest of the field, the Dogs. I think they're going to be pushing for top four. As in, that will be their preseason target, whether they'll yeah. make top four, I don't know. Two years, maybe. In two years, yeah. I can see them there. Well, their midfield's very developed, you know mm. what I mean? There's not that... I mean, they do have a lot of upside in yeah. terms of future development, like guys like Bailey Smith, but like... Norton, even Norton's still... He's bloody good, yeah. but he's still bloody raw. That's true, that's true. But their midfield is quite developed. You know, yeah. McRae, Dunkley. I guess Dunkley's has Dunkley's got a bit of upside. Bont and Pelly, yeah. But they're already playing at a really yeah. high level. Bont and McRae are probably close to where they'll be, but mm. Dunkley's yeah. probably got a bit more upside in terms of his use and skill, not in terms of statistically necessarily. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, that's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Um, the other trade to come out today, I think it was announced, that Papley has requested a trade to Carlton officially. Um, right. This is a good move for Carlton, I think. He's a 23-year-old. Uh, would have been a shout for the All-Australian top 40. I don't think he made it. Um, kicked 37 goals and it was a good pressure forward. One of the better small forwards goal-wise this year, and Sydney finished bottom four. And his pressure, I think he was very high in mm. pressure. He was, Which is something I think Carlton kind of lack. I just yeah. had a little squeeze at their lineup today, and there's no real good sort of small forwards uh, they've got uh, on the list. But Betts has also, is yeah. probably going to end up at Carlton as well. Um, that adds a really interesting dynamic. I think they've lacked a little bit of goal-scoring power when you take away Mackay and Kerno, who are A, yeah. developing, and B, mm. tall anyway. And those two around... Mackay and Kerno, more importantly. Yeah. Eddie Betts crumbing off Mackay, mm-hmm. big packs. A bit of leadership Papley, as well yeah. on the field, Betts. So you can imagine him being a fairly good mentor. But the thing is with Papley, which is interesting, he's got four years left on his contract. With Sydney? Yeah. Shit. So Carlton may have to part with pick eight or be involved in some sort of Danaher swap. We'll get onto the Danaher and anything yeah. in a second. That's a really interesting change. That could be an interesting freeway. Yeah. And also the trade. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I think that would be a really good pickup for the Blues. If they get Papley and Betts and their players start to improve, where do you think Carlton could realistically aim for next year? Do you think they, they could be the final? new 13, mate? I think they could be the new, f- that sort of yeah. talent. Like where Freo were at this year, I think they could be there, They'd knock off a few good teams, probably have a couple of disappointing games. I agree. But on the whole, be in the thick of it. Yeah. I think uh, when T came in, this is just an outsider's view, but it felt like he gave more expanded roles to mature players like Murphy and yeah. stuff like that. That's why we saw Murphy come good. Revitalised. Yeah. So I wonder, and I, I think that was the right option because yeah. I think Carlton needed to become more competitive straight away for the sake of development. But I wonder if because of that, they're going to give more time to Dow, more time to, or Walsh is already getting the time, but Mm. like, you know, these young midfielders that they've got in like Stocker, they're still going to need games pumped into them. So like you say, I wonder if, I think they'll improve a little bit, but I don't think they'll improve like some of the suggesting, I think a few people suggesting Dark Horse finals. 
Um, but we'll we'll talk more about predictions later. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty confident with my assertion there that with that new Freo sort of team, I think that's right in yeah. their wheelhouse for next season. I agree. That's a good good uh, comparison. Um, we'll touch on the Saints real quick. Is there another interesting side this off season? They're going to lose uh, Bruce probably. Mm-hmm. Jack Stephen could be on his way to Geelong. Uh, Jake Carlisle, they might be shopping around. Blake Akers has been linked to WA, albeit not very strongly. But they might gain... They, I think they're in the hunt for Zach Jones again. Yeah, I've um, heard Zach Jones a bit. Bradley Hill probably will end up at the club and so will Paddy Ryder. So there's a bit of shuffling of the deck chairs there. I wonder, can, will they make it a net negative or a net positive this year, do you think? I think a positive just because of someone like Brad Hill compared to what they're sure. putting out. He's that much better well, than I think... Jack yeah. Stephen. Oh, yeah, Stephen, I is guess. He's a pretty good player. I don't know if you think he's better than Hill, but there's not I that think, far I think, yeah, actually, yeah, that's fair. But Stephen, they've... St. Kilda have stated himself, it's, he's at the point where if it's for his mental health and he's better off in Geelong. Sure, yeah. They'll do what they've got to do. Yeah, they'll look they'll, after They'll him get there. compensated, obviously, but mm. they won't be dicks sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, interesting. But I think it is a bit of a win for them. They've had a player of Brad Hill's quality yeah. who wants to play for them. Especially, they've struggled with that. I didn't know this one. Paddy Ryder's Brad Hill's cousin. That was a factor in Paddy Ryder wanting to go to St. Kilda so he could play mm. with his cousin Bradley. It was interesting what Paddy Ryder said about um, touring Essendon and getting a bad feeling and then going to St Kilda and there was a sense of excitement. Uh-huh. It feels very surface level, doesn't it? Mm. Like, oh, I just got a good vibe, so I'll go with you. Oh, interesting, like, respect. Choose, uh-huh. choose Still, he has that him. history with Essendon, even though they've yeah. gotten past it and he's gotten past it, he probably didn't want to... Oh, yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, But it just the way he said it, it more sounded yeah. like it was a vibe. But I agree. He didn't leave Essendon on great terms and while they're a different club, more or less, yeah. now... Um, yeah, it is interesting. Danaher to Swans is probably one of the more interesting trade discussions this off season, yeah. I'd say. First of all, um, why do you think the Swans are pushing hard for Danaher? The whole thing to me sounds like one big Mexican standoff. I think <laughs> I said this. I think we talked about it before, and yeah. I said this, but because Danaher doesn't want to be the one to ask out of Essendon necessarily, mm. and then Essendon don't want to be seen the ones giving up of. A lot, mm. Like a lot, like I have a lot of people around the club like the mm. fans, fan favorite, that sort of thing. And then Sydney don't want to, yeah, trap on toe. So it's sort of one big Mexican standoff until someone sort of publicly goes, yeah, we're interested in Danher. Yeah, I think the Swans. Or I'm interested in Sydney. I think from an Essendon standpoint, it'd be really bad to lose Danaher mm. for where they're at. Um, he didn't, they didn't get a lot of footy out of him this year. They need to improve. They're under pressure to try and push up the ladder now yeah. They're from an inf- impatient fan base who you know want to win finals. He's an but, instant source of improvement if they can have him on the park. F- yeah, potential to be one of the best keys in the league. Yeah. Um, but from a Sydney's per- perspective, I found it really interesting. Other than the fact that he's got a father-son link um, and he's a massive marquee player, they don't need a player like Danaher when Buddy's got a number of years left, probably two to three. In my opinion, uh-huh. Blakey's talented. Mm. Um, McCartan, yeah. uh, Sam Reed, I guess they could probably phase out, but then Will Hayward is another sort mm. of lead up kind of forward. Danaher seems like a really strange place to invest your resources. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. probably going to cost them pick four. Yeah. Um, would you do it if you were Sydney for pick four, Danaher? Maybe. It depends on how much faith you have in Buddy. I probably don't have quite as much in him as you do. I think he can still perform, but not at. Buddy levels, maybe him as like a second or third toll complementing. Mm. But I mean, worst case scenario, you, well, not worst case scenario, but like likely it is you've got to play them both in the same team for like two years. Yeah. It's a lot of money mm. considering Danaher would probably fetch a fairly good contract. I don't know. I just yeah. think it's a really interesting decision from Sydney who obviously want to get these marquee sort of plays in the side for marketing reasons. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how that plays out. Personally, I don't know if he's actually going to leave. Like you said, it does yeah. sound like a little bit of like talk over maybe nothing, mm. but um, very interesting set of events. The other big name player to potentially move clubs is Tim Kelly. Yeah. Um, now, he, there's been no official trade request yet, but my gut feeling is he's going to West Coast or at least going to request mm. a trade to West Coast. What do you think it will take for him to, to join West Coast from Geelong? They'd probably want two first as just a starting yeah. point, and then yeah. a l- not too much more, but a little bit more than just two first. I think. I was listening to Damien Barrett this morning, interestingly, and um, 
I know he doesn't always make that many good calls, but he was, he was making. I, I just thought he sounded really silly this morning. He said, "I don't see how Tim Kelly gets to West Coast. I don't see how it's, they all gets done because last year they were nowhere near it." Getting a deal done. Okay, two factors in that. Tim Kelly's uncontracted now, which makes a hell of a lot of difference. Also, West Coast didn't have a first rounder last year, so I think mm. he just didn't think of that. West Coast now yeah. have two first rounders and then an extra second rounder this year. Two first rounders is achievable for West Coast. So they've got pick 14 this year and maybe pick 14-ish next year, um, which counts as two late firsts. And I think they could flip someone like a Petrocelli. Mm. I think that could get done. Or steak knives on the deal sort of thing. Yeah, whether it be to to Geelong directly or to a big club for like a second rounder. And then, you know, come up with some sort of steak knives. There's been talk of Brander. I really hope that doesn't happen. Uh Brander's a really talented key forward prospect. Um, I'd be pretty loath to let go of Yeah, that. I've heard similar conversations with Sean Darcy, who's Freo's linked player in yep. our own attempts to get Kim, Tim Kelly. Kim Telly. Kim Telly. Yeah. Well, Darcy is a very good ruck prospect. And, there's not and he's from Geelong many. as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we have a couple of Geelong boys yeah. in, um, or Vic Country boys at least, yeah. in Nelson and Cole. But whether they'd be worth that much, probably not. Cole's a really good player, I reckon, but... Um, had a down year, yeah. and Petrocelli probably comparatively has a bit more value. So, especially the way I've seen some of these analysts like watching Fox Footy and stuff, the way they value Petrocelli, like after Rioli stuff went down, they're like Petrocelli is a required player at West Coast. Yeah. He was like, "Well, that's a bit of a stretch." I'd probably still play Jared Cameron over him yeah, personally. I would too. I think, yeah, Petrocelli probably does offer a little bit more if you're playing a grand final tomorrow. I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. not even. He kind of is a one-trick pony, as much as I hate to say it. Yeah. <laughs> He's Jared, just... Ca- Jared Cameron's really good. I agree. I agree. I think the Eagles probably should go down the path of developing Cameron next year in light of the fact that Rioli's probably played his last game of AFL. Um, but, yeah. Even if Rioli was still on the side, I'd go... Cameron, even though he's a lot more similar to your Ryan and Rioli style yeah. of player compared to Petrocelli. Yeah. Just three of those guys. It's better than two of those guys. You want as many of those sort of players in your team as you can get, yeah. I think. I agree. Especially for goals. As many creative ways to get a goal as you can have doesn't hurt in the AFL. I agree. Cameron's very raw. He's purely mm. just like just 18. Well, no, not just 18. He'd be 19 yeah. now. Um, so they had a bit of time to develop him. But I agree with what you say. I don't think... I think the whole Petrocelli is now required play is probably a bit of a media build-up slash yeah. West Coast putting that out there. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. Cool. And as we sort of come towards the end of True Footy Podcast 39, Bush, um, more big news in the AFL scene today. It's actually been a pretty big day for news. Yeah. Um, but significantly, Fremantle has a new coach. And officially. It's your people boy. have sort of known for a couple of days, but officially announced today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Justin Longmuir has taken over as head coach. Big rig. What is your initial reaction to that? It was my f- preference all along, so I'm pretty happy, i got to be honest. The Freo boy... Played well for us for years. Great guy. He's re- like he retired quite early, which is something people don't realize. He only retired when he was twenty six years old. Did he? Yeah. Wow. He's only thirty eight years old. I knew he was thirty eight, but I didn't realize. Yeah. This. But wow. he's been in coaching for ten years. That's a crazy thing. So he pretty much went straight into coaching from retiring. He was an assistant at Freya for a few years. He was an assistant with your boys as a forwards coach, I believe. Does that mean he retired in 07? Yeah, something like that. Really? Yeah. Do you know why? Why? Do you know why? Oh, no, he? I don't. I, I was surprised when I saw he'd retired that early, but yeah. yeah. Interesting. That's the thing. He's still young. He's relatable to a lot of players. Like, he played with Mundy and mm. Sandlands and, yeah. yeah, those two are the only two left from that sort of era. Teague was another one who went into coaching like, at, like, 27, 28, yeah. I think, at West Coast. Interesting. But, yeah, anyway. Yeah, um, so yeah like- that was the factor. If we didn't, the little side note, if we didn't get him, Carlton were all over Longmuir mm. because of him and Teague's connection at West Coast. They yeah. would have been, like, True. 1A, 1B head coach sort of thing. Interesting. Well, someone actually announced that Longmuir had accepted a job at Carlton a few weeks ago. Who was that? Somebody I, reported I it. think he probably accepted it subject to the Freo position. Yeah, okay. Because it sounded like he was going to Carlton if he didn't get the head coaching gig yeah. here. Yeah, okay. As like an associate head coach type thing with Teague. That would make sense, but it was reported that he had like accepted it and yeah. he was not going to uh, Fremantle. And then I think later that yeah. day... Was it Tom Brown or one of the Toms? Something Morris or like Brown, that, yeah. like incorrectly reported it. But yeah, mm. anyway. What are your hopes and dreams for Longmuir next season, man? Do you What do you think, like, what do you want the approach to be? Do you want to go gung-ho at just trying to finish as high as you can with the, the list you have? Or do you want to focus on guys like um, Chera, 
Brayshaw. I think um, we've got a list that can go. That's the thing we've got. Yeah. We've got a pretty talented list. I just think we need. He needs to get the forwards the ball in good positions where they can actually lead and attack the ball rather than have it kicked on top of their heads and yeah. Really get everyone in good position to succeed. Get the skills up, which is crucial because that was probably Ross's almost his biggest Achilles here was the lack of emphasis on skills because mm. we were butchers with the ball throughout the yeah. Ross era, 100%. even for all the positives of it. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. I think he can bring a more modern approach yep. and get us playing that style where it's more kicking and efficiency. Yep. Okay, so would you see more like a sort of philos- philosophical sort of switch up in game style? Would you mm. prefer to see that rather than a focus on winning games? Well, I think, yeah. Well, to an extent, I think that will... I think they're conducive. I think the change sure. of philosophy brings more wins. It may not, though. So in some instances, like a change of game style may see you take one step back to go two steps forward, if that makes sense. So, mm. um, like, so I guess... Yeah, it might were... take a year or two to get the skills up to a level where we yeah. can execute it, but... Yeah. I feel even so, we can still apply that pressure and yeah. manic ability that we have shown defensively still we have that in us I we just need the offensive class to complement it true and i think you need a better injury run because you had a mm, lot of and injury. our spine was decimated yeah the spine does hurt definitely yeah literally but yeah anyway i think that was a pretty good note to end true footy podcast 39 we've been doing weekly podcasts since the start of the finals i don't know if we'll keep up that momentum bush maybe we can go to like every two to four weeks or something like that. Whenever there's enough information to cover with trade period and the draft and that, stuff, I guess. 100%. That's half of what it is. It's enough content for us to actually have a yarn about. Well, there's going to be a lot of that during trade period. So yeah. maybe, we, maybe we do one like in the middle of trade period yeah. and then one at the end. Maybe an early mid-end. Yeah. Something like that even. Yeah, that, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Um, in other exciting news, we may get Callum Toomey to be able to do a Skype podcast with me Ooh. before the draft. So um, that is to help uh, by well, our friend friend of the channel, Lucas, um, might be able to sort that for us. So um, fingers crossed. No pressure now that I've announced it. Everyone will become banging for blood if it doesn't happen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So hopefully that'll be good. And, um, you know, going into the off season as well, I want to start getting some other YouTubers on the podcast via Skype as well. So I'm thinking the pair, Backyard Charizard, Young King Cookson, mm-hmm. Twisty. Um, I'm going to ask Hayden. I haven't asked him yet. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to see that sort of stuff, let us know in the comments and what kind of questions you want uh, me to ask them. So, um, yeah, very exciting time. I'm really looking forward to it. And the trade period. Absolutely. Cool. All right, guys. Well, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe. Um, we also do these podcasts on iTunes and Spotify for future reference. So, thanks very much. And shout we'll see out you next to time. Hughesy on my T-shirt. Yes, shout out to Hughesy. That's not Dave Hughes. That's... Um, yeah. Reese Hughes, Hughes, the notorious (laughs) B.I.G. Thanks, guys. See you next time.